Evolution, the natural process that shaped all life and can lead from this to this. It's driven by random genetic mutation and natural selection. Random mutations create variation. Sometimes a change gives an advantage, like cells that can detect light to help seek out safer environments. Survivors pass along the changes to future generations. Further changes can occur over many generations and sometimes hundreds of millions of years. Fast forward to today. Now we have molecular tools that can allow us to alter the direction that life takes, including our own. The most accurate and effective tool yet for gene editing is called CRISPR. We can use it to essentially rewrite any gene however we choose, potentially fixing mutations that cause disease. The most common analogy for how CRISPR works is the find and replace function of a word processor. And with CRISPR, what used to take nature millions of years can now be done in a lab in just days. It is a groundbreaking tool with unprecedented power. It shows promise for curing cancers, ALS, and many other diseases. We've already engineered malaria-proof mosquitoes and may create mice immune to Lyme disease. But possessing the power to forever alter the future of life raises difficult questions. What could justify genetically modifying the ecology around us? Should we move beyond curing diseases to making other genetic enhancements? Are there any lines we shouldn't cross? How can we avoid the misuse of this powerful technology? And can humanity even agree on the future of our very own genetic destiny? Tonight, we're going to hear from a range of experts working on different aspects of CRISPR, which stands for Cultured, Regularly Interspaced, Short, Palindromic Repeats. Wow. wow. But we are not going to let that scare us, are we? No. So allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. Josephine Johnston is a bioethicist and lawyer at the Hastings Center. She works on the ethics of emerging biotechnologies with a focus on their use in reproduction, psychiatry, genetics, and neuroscience. So please welcome Josephine Johnston. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and has served on several national research committees studying the environmental and health effects of the commercialization of genetically engineered crops. Please say hello to Fred Gould. <laughs> Samuel Sternberg is an assistant professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at Columbia University. He is the co-author with Jennifer Doudner of A Crack in Creation, The Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. Sam Sternberg. <laughs> Neville Sanjana is on the faculty of the New York Genome Center, an assistant professor in the departments of biology and neuroscience and physiology at New York University. Neville Sanjana. So first we're going to start with an overview of the great potential of this technology, CRISPR, in terms of human diseases. Research is underway on a number of conditions. Um, and I'm just going to throw it first off to Neville, right away. Don't oh, okay. be surprised. Yeah, just great. tell us <laughs> what good. the range of diseases is that CRISPR has the potential to cure. Yeah, so I think in the last few years, it's had just a huge impact across biomedical science. And some of the diseases are uh, very common diseases. What a lot of us know, folks who have cancer, um, cancers like skin cancer, lung cancer, uh, blood cancers. Um, there's also a lot of non-cancer applications, I think, with CRISPR-2, um, blood diseases like sickle cell anemia or beta thalassemia, um, and uh, other diseases that are being worked on right now uh, with CRISPR are some eye diseases, some diseases of the retina that um, result in blindness. So I know that there's been a lot of research on mice and monkeys. 
but none of this has applied to humans yet, has it? There, there are clinical trials um, either underway, depending on in some countries already underway, and um, definitely in advanced planning stages in U.S. and Europe uh, and China. I heard that China actually did use CRISPR for an eye disease, right, mm -hmm. on one person. I th Do I think we know what the outcome was? I don't think that's been published yet, but there's actually a number of clinical trials for cancer that have started in China um, where you use CRISPR to edit immune cells that actually get delivered back into patients to hunt down cancerous cells of the body. So I, I don't think it's, it's too early to say how effective these treatments are going to be, but there's a lot of hope, I think, across the scientific community that there's kind of this new age of, of precision medicine using gene editing to treat some of these more common genetic diseases or cancers in a fundamentally new way. Wow. So Fred, just as an overview, just to start the whole discussion, tell us about CRISPR's potential in plants and animals. Yeah, well, um, especially in plants, um, there's the possibility of using CRISPR to change the genetic composition of some of our crop plants to make them more resistant to plant diseases. And that could decrease the use of insecticides or herbicides and also of fungicides and so on. So that's been a very important contribu possible contribution. And with animals, uh, the hornless cow that uh, was recently uh, produced. You know, the, the idea what? that- The what? Yeah. So, well, <laughs> bulls will have horns and uh, typically uh, you have to do sort of a surgical operation to uh, yeah. get rid of the horn. So the idea that you could engineer these uh, cattle not to have horns is something that has been done uh, by regular breeding, but could also be done using those things. But a lot of these things are just starting to be considered and are not actually on the market yet. You know, I did a story on 60 Minutes about 10 years ago on a, a, a program to bring back extinct animals. Mm. And I've read that CRISPR may be used in that kind of an effort. Sam? I think there's a, a book that's coming out or has come out um, using CRISPR to resurrect woolly mammoths. Now we had a discussion earlier, like how realistic is that actually? Um, I would still put it personally in the box of science fiction, but the, the point is we actually, you know, scientists have decoded the entire genetic sequence of the woolly mammoth from fossil samples, from preserved specimens, and you can compare the Asian elephant genome and the woolly mammoth genome, pinpoint all of the precise DNA changes between the two, and now use this powerful gene editing technology to actually go into Asian elephant cells and start changing individual genes one at a time from the version that modern day elephants have to the version that woolly mammoths once had. And, and so there's the idea could- And the elephant would give birth, right? Well, that's the part that I think no one's worked out <laughs> IVF in an elephant and I, you know, the gestation time of elephants is like two years and I, you know, that's the big, the big question, could you ever actually give birth to something that even resembled a woolly mammoth? I'd say not in my lifetime, I would guess. But if you read the news stories about it, people say five, 10 years. Josephine, just as an overview, what are some of the negative aspects of this as a bioethicist? Well, the first thing I would say is I think because it's a platform technology with so many different uses, it's not sort of just a good or a bad technology or and the uses really vary. But people who are speaking about some of the concerns that they might have across these different potential uses are um, you know, concerned about a real range of things from safety type questions about like how would we know, uh, could people create um, sort of weapons out of using these technologies? That's one sort of really sort of uh, very clearly dangerous and potentially frightening scenarios and that people are looking at all the way across to questions around how appropriate it is for humans to have such a lot of control over the genes of our um, gen ourselves, our children, or um, animals, and to what ends, like what are we pursuing? What's the purpose of it? So there are a lot of questions raised right across those different uses. And as we move forward, we'll be discussing the pros and cons. So we set the stage, but let's go back in history a little bit and talk about all the different ways that we were manipulating um, ed evolution and our genes before CRISPR, um, and for good or bad. So Fred, um, start out with us on the 
plants yeah. and the manipulation yeah. of plant genetics. Right, right. So I, I think that many of you probably do know that your plants didn't just arise from nowhere. Uh, they were almost all um, bred by farmers and by technicians over thousands of years. And so we often use the example of teosinte, which is a, sort of a weed that grows in Mexico with a very small uh, seed pod. And that has been, over time, changed by farmers who have just selected the best plants that had the most nutrition over time to bigger and bigger uh, corn. And today we have modern corn as a result of that. So we also have the same thing with our animals. Uh, both in terms of farm animals, but also think about your dogs and cats. Think about the odd goldfish you can buy in a store. We've manipulated uh, animals and plants for a long period of time. And what about food? Who wants to tackle food? Well, I think you just Okay, Fred, food. come yeah, back. Yeah, to I'll us. come Tell back us to about food. What we're sure, eating. sure. I mean, yeah, is it all so, genetically modified today? Yeah, so I, I think it's a very, so the, genetically modified, okay? So I just told you about teosinte being bred to become the modern day corn plant. That is genetically modified from teosinte. But when people talk typically about genetically modified or GMOs, yeah. they're talking about something that has been engineered. And we have to talk about the difference between that. Right? So, and I think a lot of it goes back to a cultural thing about what is natural and what is not natural. And it's natural to just save seeds that are better and better and move ahead. It's, most people will say that is natural, but they wouldn't say that it's natural to take cells out of a plant and insert DNA in them to make them different. And so we have about 80 to 90% of our corn, soybean, and cotton in the United States has been developed that way. Genetically modified. Genetically GMO. engineered. And I like to use the term genetically engineered because it's engineering, right, in the sense that it's actually thinking about an architectural pl plan of a plant and changing it, as opposed to something that you just do tinkering with it, as some people would say. So that's a, a big change in terms of how people relate to something that's been b developed those different ways. And to go back and say that What's the difference between a plant that has the same characteristics? Let's say you change a corn plant from being yellow to being blue based on conventional breeding, like the uh, folks in Mexico have done. But then you do the same thing using genetic engineering. Is that different? Would you accept it more if it was done one way versus what do you the think? other? I think people respond very strongly because of cultural values. And actually, um, there was a map uh, of you know, where these engineered crops are grown. And in the United States, we grow about 10 or more different genetically engineered crops. In Mexico, they grow genetically engineered soybeans and genetically engineered cotton, but they don't allow genetically engineered maize or corn because that's sacred to them. You know, if you look at Diego Rivera's paintings, mm -hmm. corn is a main sacred object. So under those kind of conditions, there's a cultural thing against having something that's been built artificially. And you there's a this, good map right that's there. That's a map. Yeah. It's telling us where GMOs or right. genetically engineered yeah. crops right. are what accepted? Where, where, are they, where are they grown commercially within the, the legal framework of regulation? And China is a very good example where they have almost 100% genetically engineered cotton, but in terms of legally grown rice, there is zero percent genetically engineered rice. And it sometimes surprises people in a top-down supposed society. Uh, the government would like to have genetic engineering, but they have a very big Greenpeace movement in China, surprises Americans, and that they don't trust that their rice would be safe if it was genetically engineered. Josephine, do you think this tampering, tinkering, modifying nature is part of human nature? <laughs> Have we been always doing it as long as there's been a recording of what we've done? So there are, yeah, probably. And um, that doesn't really tell us if it's good or bad, right? There are lots of things we have been doing for centuries, if not millennia, that are 
you know, are good and some of them are also not good. Wars. Well, so there are a lot of things that are, we War do naturally and they may or may not be good. Good or bad may depend on your culture. Uh, yeah, and, and it attitude. could also depend. I mean, there are a lot of, at the, some of the interesting differences, I guess, between those two different ways of getting blue corn are also to do with the, the time frame, right? The speed, the ability to look at something developing in, yeah. um, in, in concert with its surroundings that you just, when you speed something up, you, you may or may not also miss certain aspects right. of it. So I, th there are many things I think that people are objecting to when they raise concerns right. about genetically modified foods. And safety is maybe one of them, but there are also issues around who controls the food supply, um, having a limited diversity of crops ultimately, right. um, whether or not there are certain companies who then have a lot of power over things that farmers have actually been doing for centuries their right. own way. So there are a lot of other issues in there, I think, also around trust yeah. that are not just represented by concerns about safety. Yeah. Sam, jump up to the 70s and 80s into the modern era of genetic technology. And what were the tools that we used after we understood more about the genome before CRISPR, sure, BC so. before CRISPR, so Fred just brought up, you know, GMO or genetically engineered foods and the kinds of um, crops we have like, you know, corn, rice, these other ones, those were using recombinant DNA. So, you know, in the 70s there was this revolution where researchers developed a set of tools um, that they could use to piece together bits of DNA in test tubes. So it's the first time that you could really isolate specific genes you could package them in different ways, and you could actually introduce that genetic material into E. coli for designer bacterial strains, into plants, into animals. You could make um, genetically engineered mice because of this ability to manipulate DNA inside of the laboratory. Now, it's not the same precision for making changes that we might have today, but Neville, I think you were going to talk about this picture that these are some, some mice that you developed yourself, huh? Uh, this is a, a, a is this picture of. This pre-CRISPR. This is not mice I developed myself, but these these are mice that have a protein from jellyfish. So, uh, jellyfish, um, many species of jellyfish have this uh, naturally uh, produced this green fluorescent protein, and so these mice were developed to be able to visualize different cells. So we were using them to actually look to see how um, the axons of neurons grow this is during my my PhD work and find uh, their neighbors and connect up in the brain. And so it's very nice to be able to visualize these um, with this green fluorescent protein. And so this is a... Uh, so they glowed in the dark? They can glow in black lights, exactly. So they're, they're party mice, but they're very useful for science. Uh, and how did you do it? So this was done uh, by a Japanese group um, that introduced, uh, not in the CRISPR era, but randomly introduced this transgene uh, this, we call it a transgene because it comes originally from a different species, from the jellyfish, randomly into, into the mouse genome. Um, it sounds, uh, doesn't sound, I read that even with CRISPR, but we're going to stay away from that, even with CRISPR, that all the discoveries have been, have come because you've studied nature and you've looked at what nature had done and then you build on that. So the basis of both what you're talking about and CRISPR comes from uh, observing the way nature would move forward. Is that correct? That's, that, that's why being a bioengineer, and I mean, Sam can talk to this too, but why being a bioengineer I think is so exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's self-justifying my career choice, but it's fun because there's so much inspiration, I think, mm. um, in nature and so many useful tools that have been created over millennia of evolution on this, this planet. And I think the tool that we're talking about today, CRISPR and, and other tools, are, you know, it's, uh, it's an exciting thing to do to be able to, to see these working in one context in nature and then try and use them perhaps translationally for medicine or for plants. Um, so as, as we come up to today, with all the fears that people have about GMOs, and the kind of crossbreedings and the things you're talking about. Have any of the fears been realized? Why, are, why is the public so against GMOs? Um, I think there probably people have different reasons that they're concerned. Um, I do think that the safety of them just to eat hasn't been explored or explained adequately. 
So but it's been around for a long time. Um, well, no. well I, I would say, so we, we have been eating genetically engineered corn in the United States since 1996. So we've had quite a few years of, of eating that genetically engineered corn. But the question is, how would you know if it was doing something? And I would just say, you know, I, I spent quite a while uh, chairing a, co a committee with the National Academies um, looking at the safety and looking at the testing that was done. As many of you have probably seen uh, newspapers or on the internet of these rats with big tumors and, and things. But, you know, looking through from those. From GMOs? Yeah, from GMOs. I mean, it's, it's something that cruises around the internet all the time. But when you look at it carefully, not all the tests that have been done have been appropriate or powerful enough to say if there's a small difference. But if you take all the testing that's been done over this long period of time, there's no evidence at all that has emerged either from the actual animal testing or even we did a comparison of people who live in the US and Canada where GMOs are, are prevalent to people who live in the UK or the EU where they haven't been able to ask these questions about whether chronic diseases have increased faster in the US and Canada than what you see in the EU and the UK. And when you look at the numbers of things, everywhere from diabetes to cancer, different kinds of cancer, Obesity. you don't see any change different in the US and Canada compared to the EU and the UK. Now, somebody could say, well, that hasn't been a long enough period of time. But you know, science is always that way. I think probably many of you know that if you live long enough, you find out that eggs are good or bad or salt. You should have this much or that much. You know, science changes. But I, I think that no really strong, uh, acute changes have occurred uh, based on people, you know, company, countries where they eat GMOs. How CRISPR came to be, the creation story, is an amazing one, made possible by the work of many labs all around the world. So my first question at this stage is, how does it work? And we're going to watch a short primer that was uh, produced by one of the CRISPR pioneers, Jennifer Doudner is going to Doudner. teach us how it works. <laughs> CRISPR is a technology for changing the sequence of DNA in cells in a precise fashion to correct mutations that might otherwise cause disease. So scientists can actually change an individual base pair in the, th in the more than three billion base pairs in a human cell. The fun thing about the CRISPR technology for me is that this is a project that started off as a basic science, curiosity-driven project. It was a collaboration between my lab and the lab of Emmanuel Charpentier. We teamed up to discover the function of the protein Cas9 and how it acts to disrupt viral DNA in bacteria that have a viral infection. We came to understand the way that Cas9 is programmed by RNA molecules in bacteria to recognize specific DNA sequences and then make a break in the DNA. We figured out that we could actually program Cas9 to cut any DNA sequence by redesigning the way the guide RNA in the protein is being used in cells. That understanding led to really the aha moment, realizing that this could be actually a very powerful technology in animal and plant cells. It's very exciting because it's going to enable a lot of science to be done that was impossible to do in the past. So Sam, you worked with Jennifer Doudna, Dowd, mm -hmm. am I saying it right, in her lab. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us your role, but also help explain, the, I, I was confused, Cas9, is, is it a bacteria? I always like to um, stress that there's CRISPR technology, which is what we think of when we talk about gene editing, making these genetic changes in human cells and plants, animals. But what got us all interested in CRISPR in the first place was this fundamental question she just talked about, which has nothing to do with higher organisms, but just bacteria. And thinking about how bacteria can stay healthy when they're growing in the soil, in the human gut, Every place that bacteria reside, they're actually being constantly bombarded by viruses. And these bacterial viruses are the most prevalent form of life on Earth, actually. 
Um, they outnumber even the grains of sand on the planet. There are more viral particles that infect bacteria. And so there's this big question, how do bacteria protect themselves? And it's been known since um, the middle of the 20th century that they have innate immune systems, much like humans do. But um, what, what uh, a number of different research groups discovered in the mid-2000s is that they have this other form of immunity called CRISPR, which uses a pair of molecular scissors, so this kind of oversimplified schematic on the slide, where they actually recognize DNA from a virus during an infection, and they slice it in half, and that leads to the viral genome or the viral genetic code being destroyed, and the bacteria can survive the infection. And so the, CRISPR, is that also called CRISPR? Yeah, CRISPR has kind of become this umbrella term. To, it, really what it refers to is the overall immune system, but the star player that's now trans, transformed gene editing technology is a particular enzyme called Cas9. And the Cas is actually an acronym that comes from CRISPR associated. So, so Cas9 is not a bacteria. It's a bacterial enzyme, so a protein molecule, one specific protein that some bacteria produce. And actually, the, the genesis story was done in a bacterium called Streptococcus thermophilus. You eat it every day, you have a, a, a um, bowl of yogurt. So it's the main workhorse to ferment milk into yogurt and other dairy products. And it was um, a company that was trying to make these bacterial fermentation cultures more virus resistant that led to the discovery of CRISPR actually. So every time you eat yogurt, you're eating CRISPR actually. But it was the discovery that you can take these specific pieces out of those bacteria and put them in a human cell or a plant cell or an animal cell that led to this revolution in gene editing. To, to me, it's, it's really fascinating. I think you, you mentioned this, but it's worth stressing this, that this is an adaptive immune system in bacteria. Bacteria are single, tiny, single-celled organisms. You know, we're these, uh, whatever, trillions of interacting cells uh, that make us up, and we have an adaptive immune system. We know we have antibodies, and we have T cells that fight off infections, but that's because we have so many cells. But it's, to me, it's just mind-blowing still that a single cell, a tiny, one-celled organism, has an adaptive immune system, meaning that word adaptive means it can have a memory of previous um, invaders, previous viruses that it's encountered, which it keeps in this, um, in this CRISPR area of its genome, and then can, when it sees something that matches that memory, as Sam said, it's a molecular scissors. It can cut it and get rid of it before it harms and sickens the bacteria. It's a very cool. Let's do a round. We'll start with Neville, we'll come all the way around. Tell us in your own, and from your own perspective, in your own words, what you think is so revolutionary about CRISPR. Neville, you oh, okay, that's, that's a good question. What's so revolutionary about CRISPR? Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard, I think, to overstate that, uh, what, what it's enabled us to do. So basically, um, one thing that we as biologists and geneticists have been limited in some ways is we have this concept in biology of a genetic model organism. So you might hear a lot of studies that involve either bacteria or fruit flies or mice. And you might wonder, well, why do scientists just love these couple um, organisms that I keep hearing about? Why do I hear so much about mice, but not about rats? Is it just that mice are cuter and scientists like using cute animals? There's a reason, actually, that, that, that they've um, kind of fixated on a few different organisms, and that's because those are genetic model organisms, meaning their genomes have been easier to manipulate so we can understand what changes in their DNA, in their, in their genetic code, what they, what they do to those animals. We can understand the connection between the DNA, the genotype, and the phenotype, how it looks to us, how the animal behaves. And that's been the case um, up until very, very recently. And I think the, uh, one of the real breakthroughs in the CRISPR era is the idea of the genetic model organism is, is very different now because everything can be a genetic model organism, including um, what a lot of people consider the most important organism or model organism, which is us. We would like to study something to understand about how our genes result in maybe diseases that, that we get and how we can repair those, those defects. And so human cells, the DNA was actually quite hard to manipulate until, quite, until recently. And really, any organism now is a genetic model organism with CRISPR. 
I'm supposed Sam? to follow that? Yeah, try to follow uh, I went on too oh. long. Can I just pass and say that, that <laughs> too? I agree just, with that. Um, I guess for me, I mean, I love your, your wondering about how does this work, because that's what's gotten me excited, is really the mechanics of the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what is often unappreciated about even CRISPR is that um, it's become a moving target because there's no one thing that defines CRISPR because what we've discovered over the last um, 10 years or so is that there are all different flavors of CRISPR where the Cas9 protein that we've been talking about isn't even present, where different strains or different groups of bacteria have evolved different types of enzymes that might work similarly but do completely different things wow. or um, or not even edit DNA, but edit RNA. Um, and one thing that a lot of researchers are doing now is harnessing, continuing to harness nature um, and kind of remain inspired by what bacteria and other microorganisms have evolved to be able to do over evolutionary time and then think about how can we re-engineer the system and use it in more and more creative ways to, to solve problems. OK, good. I'm it's up like next. a contest. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So here we go. So uh, we'll take this to a higher level. Here. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm an entomologist. <laughs> that was pretty high, Fred. Well, I'm an entomologist. Right, Fred, I'm in an entomology can you bring department. It to a lower we work. Level, we, please. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so I, I study insects, and we're concerned specifically about agricultural, in, you know, insects pests on crops, but also mosquitoes that transmit diseases, and one of the most talked about is malaria. And when we think about using CRISPR to decrease disease, sometimes we're thinking about manipulating humans so they won't get the disease and so on. But with something like malaria that is transmitted by a mosquito, people have been working for many years with transgenic mosquitoes where you've changed the genes to make it so the mosquito can't transmit malaria. Now, it sounds really good, but think about it. If you release a couple of thousand mosquitoes that you've bred in the lab, there are going to be millions of other mosquitoes that do transmit the disease. So what we've been working towards for a long time is a way to get those genes to move into the population uh, based on being inherited more than expectations by Mendelian inheritance so that it'll push the gene into the population. And people have worked for a long time on how to do that. And what has happened with this CRISPR technology that came from the biomedical researchers was this recognition that what they're trying to do is put the gene into an organism and have it function. But that's just a one-off thing. And the idea is that once you put that gene in, you can use different manipulations so that it automatically continues to put itself into new organisms. So when you give birth, all of your offspring will have those genes instead of half of them. So if you think about linking that with a gene for not transmitting malaria, all of a sudden, that mosquito population becomes a nuisance, but not something that's transmitting malaria. So that's exciting. That's really exciting. In my <coughs> lifetime, this is the first time I've had a, you know, I, in my lifetime that we've actually seemed to have the means not just to select the genes of future generations, but to actually change them. And so that's monumental prospect. It isn't anything someone's doing right now that we know about, but it's certainly like dangling there as a much more real prospect. So, you know, decades of people thinking about being able to do something like that to actually potentially being able to do that is, is monumental. And the other thing that's come along with that, I think, was um, this really, I think, brave and really important move that Jennifer Doudna and other people involved in the development of the technology made, which was immediately asking for an international conversation about that potential. So that moment of open science and raising questions about your own work and acknowledging that you, the scientists, are looking for everyone else to join in the conversation, that's a monumental moment as well. I want to move us, though, okay. into the whole question about genetic changes in the human body and medicine. And so let's divide this up. First, let's talk about um, non-heritable diseases. And then, then we'll talk about heritable. So non-heritable diseases, some cancers, some blindness. Um, what benefits does CRISPR offer over the earlier technologies um, in this whole area of non-heritable? Sam or Neville, either one of you. 
Sure, I, I don't yeah. know if I'll address the non-heritable part ex exactly, but um, I think the key, I mean, we, we talked about this earlier, but really the, the key property has been the easy programmability, that this is really getting into the realm of almost like programming a computer. It's something that we can do, in, except we do it in the lab, but quite easily. And so it's enabled us to ask questions really of a different scale. So um, in uh, you know, previous decades, you'd often have a um, geneticist who spent their entire career uh, working really just closely focusing on one gene and really exploring what happens, you know, um, where that gene is maybe mutated or has other, um, uh, other changes to it, and, um, or what patients with, uh, with, with conditions that involve that gene look like. But here with this easy programmability, we can now, a single investigator, a single scientist can actually ask really genome-wide questions. They can say, of all 20,000 genes in the genome, that's how many genes are in the human genome, um, you know, what are the effects of each of these genes on the growth of a cancer cell or um, on resistance to a cancer therapy? And so that's some of the work that we've been doing in, in my and lab. And you can ask all the genes at the same time? All the genes at the same time, a single scientist. And that's, that's really an unprecedented scale um, where we can develop libraries of CRISPRs, each with a different guide RNA, this component that Sam mentioned that programs the Cas9 or CRISPR, other CRISPR enzyme to go to different places in the genome, a library of, of guide RNAs that target all of the 20,000 genes in the genome. And then we can have this pool of cells, and this is, again, human cells. This is the model organism we care about in, uh, in uh, biomedical disease uh, science. And have this pool of cells and then say, which of these cells now are resistant to a drug that they shouldn't be in? Okay, maybe this, this gene, if we see a patient with a mutation in this gene, we now know we shouldn't give them this drug. We can predict in advance of when they come into the clinic um, that this might trigger um, resistance. These are the kind of, we're not quite there yet, but this is, this is where this is heading. Let's say, uh, let's say uh, I have cancer and we're at the stage where CRISPR is ready to help me. So how, would, how, how do you administer or how will we administer CRISPR changed medicines? Yeah, is, I, it, is it IV? Is it a so, so I think in, it's impossible to predict the, the future in this field is changing rapidly, but I think we have a clue by the, the clinical trials that are just being registered right now. And a lot of them involve um, taking advantage of the immune system. That's been a huge transformation in cancer therapy over the last decade, um, is the introduction of immunotherapy first in clinical trials and now in many FDA approved um, medicines that encourage the immune system to, to fight cancer. And so um, instead of administering drugs or antibodies on a continual basis, there's the idea of taking out a small portion of cells, using gene editing to modify those immune cells, and then having something that would not require continuous administration, maybe would be administered just once. These are the trials that are starting now with, with, with gene humans. editing. With humans. On humans. It, on humans. Maybe I could talk about one example. It's actually, as far as I understand, the first clinical trial using gene editing in the pre-CRISPR days. So it's a different platform, but same basic concept. Um, for HIV positive patients, and the way this clinical trial was administered is you, um, patients have immune cells removed from their blood. They're then edited at a particular gene that's been known for decades to confer resistance to HIV viral infection. Mm -hmm. So the idea is you actually take a patient's own cells, you transform them into cells that can no longer be infected by the virus, but they're otherwise still the patient's own cells. So it's not coming from a donor where you have to worry about um, immunocompatibility. You edit the patient's own cells and then you deliver them back into the patient's bloodstream where hopefully those cells will take hold and now generate a new reservoir of the patient's edited cells that have HIV resistance and will pass on that resistance to all cells that end up coming from cell divisions. And, and, and well, if you can hit the stem cells, even better, because now they're going to have an immortalized permanent line of cells in their body that have been edited and can never be infected by HIV. And no, no. What's amazing about this is there's actually people that carry this mutation naturally. There's a few very, very lucky individuals that are basically immune to HIV, and it's yeah. through studying the basic disease mechanisms of that, of those kinds of, of individuals 
that we now know what gene could be targeted in, in the rest of us to have HIV immune cells. This technology has been offered uh, in an open source way. So it is available for scientists, am I wrong about this, all around the world, any lab, unscrupulous people or not. Um, it's even offered on the web. You can buy a CRISPR kit today online. So and is, is, is the horse out of the barn, or can we, can we get something, at least a discussion, a serious way to make sure that things about what you're talking about doesn't happen, to make sure some guy isn't making a monster in the basement. You know, all kinds of possibilities. And it, it seems that we're there. And we haven't talked about, we should have talked about it already. We should have been regulating it already. Why is it open source, for example? I, I can only really say something about the open source because um, I think the rest of the question is, is very important too. But I think in terms of science, there's some examples where things were a little bit less open source. Today, it's much easier to share because uh, of things like the internet. But um, you know, previous technologies, one famous one is, is PCR, polymerase chain reaction, which is a very famous technology in molecular biology, won a Nobel Prize. It allows us to very easily amplify specific pieces of DNA. It was created in the mid 80s. Very powerful technology that was initially patented by the, the, the company that, that discovered it and, and kept in a, in a quite proprietary way. Now it's widely disseminated. I think something that's different about the CRISPR community, and, and Sam's been uh, a key part of this um, too, is that uh, all the labs, um, the lab that I came from, Feng Zhang's lab, was really um, uh, pushed to the forefront, the idea of very quickly putting these, these tools in a nonprofit repository uh, called AdGene that would distribute them to any scientist for a very nominal cost. And um, to think, I mean, there's, there's some other things you can focus on too, but one thing that's really important to bring up is this is unusual in science, how quickly this has been shared, and it's had an unbelievably positive impact on allowing biomedical scientists to just do a lot more and a lot faster than but they could get there. But who's thinking of the downside? So you that's, I'm, 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 I'm going to talk about the, the upside. <laughs> okay. Maybe, I don't, you, can, you can have somebody else, but <laughs> that's, that's been my experience, and it's been, um, it's really been different than a lot of other science, and it's, it's uh, hard to overstate that, actually, yeah. None of, none of the scientists want to talk about the downside. I, I mean, I can say a little bit about um, the uses in humans, right, and in embryos and sperm and eggs and things like that, but I don't know the answer to these questions about how it stops somebody from ordering it over the internet and using it in an animal or an insect in a nefarious way. But certainly when it comes to humans. So even in the, the US does not have, comparatively in an international sense, doesn't have a lot of federal regulation that deals with in vitro fertilization or these reproductive technologies. Other countries, some other countries like the UK and Canada and Australia and various other countries have sort of re uh, legislation that um, regulates and oversees manipulation of sperm, eggs, and embryo, and embryos, and makes rules about what can and can't be done. And a lot of those countries have laws that say that you cannot make heritable changes to human embryos, for instance, or to the eggs or sperm. So can't make a change to the genes that will be passed on. Now they might be reconsidering just exactly how stringently they want to stick to that. Even if it's positive. Even. So at this point, yeah. So that's. But just to say that, you know, tw in 1990, the UK developed a regulatory, regulatory scheme and an oversight um, system for looking at all of this. And right now in the US, there is um, a little bit of data collected from IVF clinics so, so that we have some idea of what's going on in terms of like how many cycles of IVF are there and, and how, how do they use donor eggs. Any potential use of these gene editing technologies to make a baby would have to go through the FDA. What about saying you can't make a change, I mean, in the embryo? Um, so that, yeah. I think that's something that needs to be discussed, and it is being discussed. And I mean, Josephine earlier mentioned, you know, Jennifer Doudna and a, and a, a very large group of scientists, but also non-scientists, importantly, have been, have met, um, you know, 2015, there was an international meeting. I think there's another one planned for the end of this year. And I think that's a critical piece to really having a, a broad discussion about what, you know, on an ethical and social level should and shouldn't be offered. There's scientific 
technicalities about you know, off-target effects and unintended consequences, but I think there's also a bigger question, which is um, what kind of society do we want to live in and what types of interventions should be supported when, frankly, there's a lot of other you know, social problems in our society that would be addressed with a lot less money than might be put into you know, generating genetically edited babies for a very select few individuals. So I think it's, you know, but whether you or not are a rider... discussing it. Your community is out having conferences to discuss the ethics and what regulation makes sense. I mean, I think it's your community. Yeah. I mean, the National Academy of Sciences of the US did a whole report on the prospect of using gene editing in humans, including to make changes that could be passed on from one generation to the next. And it, um, in that report they, report, they argued for allowing potentially some heritable changes, but if they met certain really strict criteria, so for sort of stepping a wee bit back from that idea that we can't make a heritable change and saying, well, maybe we can if we can show that it's safe and effective and if it's a, a disease that's really serious versus like, you know, changing, giving people purple eyes or something. So like there was a, there's a being, or there is a but discussion think, and it's not just among scientists. Think about a, her, a heritable disease that you could eliminate mm -hmm. from the face of the earth. I mean, that's possible, that's, that's part of this. And why, yeah. why would anybody try to stop that? Or let's say those rare that? cases where you have parents that have no other option to have their own child that will be free of a disease. No intervention, as many cycles of IVF and genetic screening of embryos, none of that will allow them to have a child that doesn't inherit their disease. Yeah. You could make a strong argument for if there's a technology that can address that problem and we can administer it in a socially responsible way, should we have some red line that says, no, if you change the DNA of an embryo, that's wrong. But if you do it in a patient that lives with the disease, that's okay. I mean, some people might say, why, why are we making this distinction? We would be okay intervening surgically on a newborn baby. What's the issue with doing it earlier in development if it's a genetic intervention? And actually, that's why the UK recently changed their law around this issue to allow for something called mitochondrial replacement technology, which isn't CRISPR, but it does introduce a heritable change into the embryo. And so they have they had a whole public debate. They debated it in Parliament, and they made a change to their law to allow for this. So I do think that there are ways in which regulatory structures can be adaptive to these really compelling cases. Um, without necessarily just opening the gates. I'd like to go back to the comment that two of you made about getting rid of these diseases, this idea that if you had the ability to get rid of the scourge, yeah. and that sounds like it's global, and I guess I just, even if these technologies become pretty feasible, and I think Sam was bringing this up, who is going to get to use them? You know, are we really going to be able to eliminate a disease like that that requires us to mess around with an embryo even if we're great at it when we can't even give people enough to eat, right? So who's going to get it and who's not going to get it? And that becomes a real important social issue as to, you know, where are you going to go with this? I salute you all. I hope um, that we didn't talk over your head or under. I hope we hit it just right. That was our goal. So I want to thank you all for the work you do. Progress you've made. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.